grateful to be here with you today. Um, before we turn the lights down, can you guys just give me an idea? Raise your hands if you are here and you are a physician. Physician. Okay. And then how many? Yes. Okay. So mostly physicians. How many parents? I know there's a few parents. <coughs> Any students? Residents? Okay. And how many of you are currently seeing um, or have seen patients with tuberous sclerosis? Okay, the majority, okay, okay. All right, so I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about best practices in integrating TAN with TSC care. And I bring you greetings from Memphis, Tennessee. This is where I live in, in the United States. So we're known for blues and barbecue and um, mostly warm weather, and this is like the famous Bill Street, so if you ever come to visit us, this is where most people go have a good time listening to some music and eat. So let's talk about defining TAM. So TAM stands for, it's an acronym that stands for Tuberous Sclerosis Associated Neuropsychiatric Disorders. Um, and in essence, it's a kind of an umbrella term used to kind of describe all of these neurodevelopmental and neuropsychiatric things that can happen in tuberous sclerosis. They don't happen to everyone, but they're at high risk because of having tuberous sclerosis. This schematic shows the TAN spectrum. If you look at the umbrella, each section of the umbrella, each different color represents a level. So you have the behavioral level, the psychiatric level, intellectual level, academic level, psychosocial level, and neuropsychological level. And underneath are all the different symptoms or diagnoses that go with those levels. So it's just a way of organizing our thoughts about TAN so that we understand the breadth and scope of what can happen. These are the surveillance guidelines. So we really want folks screening for TAN at least annually. Um, and comprehensive formal evaluations at these key age, ages. So zero to three years and so forth. Um, and what we mean by comprehensive formal evaluation, so in the recommendations that wasn't clearly defined what's meant by a comprehensive formal evaluation, um, however, the way we define it in our center is that you would have a neurodevelopmental evaluation by a physician, um, that you would also have a psychological or neuropsychological evaluation, um, and then a speech and language evaluation, and then whatever else may be needed, but at least those three core evaluations. And then we want people to recognize and utilize the practice parameters that exist for some of these formal diagnoses. So in someone with autism, there are practice guidelines for autism. There are practice guidelines for ADHD. And if someone is diagnosed with that condition, even though it's associated with tuberous sclerosis, it's important for us to be aware of those and to be sure that our parents are having or getting those um, evaluations done as well. Considering the need for an individualized education plan, um, that's our term for it in the US. You know, everywhere is a little bit different, but what we mean by that is that when the individual with TSC goes to school, that there's a plan in place because everybody should be able to go to school. We had a wonderful talk um, yesterday in Mumbai uh, from one of the special educators about all the different <coughs> options for schooling in, in India specifically. And so there are different options depending on how the child is functioning. And even the adults, there was adult options to do. And then consider a medical evaluation for any sudden behavioral change. Like Dr. Kruger pointed out in his talk, you know, we looked, they looked, and there was something that was going on with the child. They assumed it was just behavioral, but it turns out it was actually an enlarging theta. So if you look in your yellow folders, each one of you should have gotten a TAN checklist. So I'd encourage you to pull that out as I'm kind of looking at that. And if you don't have one, just raise your hand and I'm sure someone can bring you one. Everybody have it. Anybody need a TAN checklist who doesn't have one, just raise your hand if you need one. Okay. Right. And so this TAN checklist was specifically created by Dr. DeVries to help guide our screening. So when we're screening for TAN, this is where we start in our clinic. 
Um, we go through each section with the family. This first section is just early development. We want to know the age at which they accomplish these tasks. And for young kids, they may have not accomplished them yet. Section two is all about current development. So what is the individual currently doing for themselves in the areas of self-care, language, and mobility? Section three, and this is where we spend the bulk of our time. Um, the TAN checklist is described as it's probably taking 15 to 20 minutes to administer if you're simply doing yeses and noes. Um, but for us, this is a living, breathing document that we use to guide our care. So there have been times when we can literally spend 40 minutes right here in this section because we want to know not only what behaviors are occurring, how long they've been occurring, what are the triggers, what things make them better, um, what things make them worse, uh, and what kind of care they're getting for each one of these conditions. So this is all behaviors in this section. Section four is all about formal diagnoses. Um, so not just suspected diagnoses, like I think my child has autism or I think he has ADHD, or he seems like he's, he has OCD, but has, have these conditions been formally diagnosed by a professional? Section five acts about um, intellectual ability, uh, whether or not it's been formally diagnosed, and even if it hasn't, what's the parent's view of how their child is functioning? The, I would say this is very important. This has actually been studied formally. When you ask parents, um, and we have parents in the room that can attest to this, how their child is doing. If you say your child's eight years old, but how is he or she functioning? Parents are pretty accurate in, in estimating. So if they tell you their child's functioning more like a four-year-old, that's something definitely to follow up on. Section six is about scholastic achievement. How are they doing academically? And section seven um, is what I call some of the higher order brain skills. So memory, executive functioning, visual spatial skills. Then section eight gets a little bit more personal. It asks about impact on self, as in self-esteem, and also, very importantly, impact on families. So how are the parents doing as a couple? How are the siblings reacting to having a sibling with challenging behaviors, with two resources, with medical complications? And in each of these eight sections at the end, we always ask, has there been a formal evaluation or support? And importantly, would you like an evaluation or support? Because some parents will point out, well, yeah, this is a problem, but I don't need your help with that. I really need your help in this area. So it helps kind of guide our care. In section nine, we ask the parents to rate how impacted or burdened they feel by all of the yeses. And they can give us a score from zero, which they're not impacted at all. These things are happening. We're well adjusted, but we're doing fine. To 10, which is we're pretty stressed out. This is a lot, and we need some help. Then, section 10, we take the time to set some goals. What do we want to do first? What do we want to do second? What do we want to do third? In their own words. And then in section 11, we see if there's anything else that we need to cover. And then 12, in section 12, as the person interviewing the family, you give a score of what you feel that how, how heavily you feel that they're impacted. Typically for our clinic, that's often the same as what they're saying. But then there are also some families who are pretty stoic. And, and sometimes it's evident to everyone else that they're breaking down, they need help. But they say, no, this is too, it's okay, I'm okay. But you can see that they're not. And so this is another way to look at TAN mainly from a research perspective right now, but if you take the way that a person has answered the TAN questions, it seems as though those symptoms cluster. And so similar to the umbrella, these are the TAN clusters. So behavioral dysregulation, um, those are the symptoms there, of aggression, uh, mood swings, temper tantrums, anxiety. The hyper, hyperactive impulsive cluster, mood and mixed disorders cluster, neuropsychological, um, ASD-like or autism spectrum disorder-like, and scholastic. Right now, this is kind of where we are, is that you know, there are certain symptoms that cluster together. Where we're hoping to go is that as we learn more about these clusters, how can knowing this information guide our treatment? So I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about our diagnostic approach. 
to patients when they come in. So the very first thing is just a really good medical history, a baseline examination. Even if you know there's all these behaviors, we want to make sure the basics are covered. Are they well nourished? Are they well hydrated? Are they sleeping? Have we gotten labs? Are their thyroid levels normal? Just all the basic, typical things that you would do for a patient. Then we focus on the neurodevelopmental examination. So what's the neurological exam like? What's their development like? What are the things that we see um, when we do developmental screening? Are there some asymmetries? Are they um, having trouble with fine motor skills? Are they having trouble with reading? Um, so we want to examine them neurodevelopmentally. Third and importantly, we want to make sure that the indicated TSC medical evaluations are covered and our STAR MRI there, especially when it comes to behavioral challenges, making sure we don't have something in the brain that needs to be addressed. We always want to know what their psychological and neuropsychological function is like. So what age child is this child functioning like? Speech and language evaluation is very important. Um, what are they understanding and how are they able to, to communicate with others? So let's consider some, these are special diagnostic considerations and these are questions um, taken from the TS Alliance of India from parents in the area. So these are a couple of questions that we got. So, my son knows and understands everything but does not talk. Even if we make him repeat words, he forgets it soon. What can be done? My son is four years old. He gets agitated very often and he can't express himself. Both of these children are nonverbal. So in addition to the things, other things that we talked about diagnostically, I would want an assistive technology evaluation for these patients. Um, and an assistive technology evaluation, what I mean by that is a speech language pathologist who is, has extra training in figuring out what sort of devices might be helpful in assisting the child in communicating, whether it's an iPad or a voice output device, or sign language or picture exchange communication systems. What else can we be doing? Here's another. My son bites, punches, kicks, and has other aggressive behavior. What can I do? <coughs> My son hits himself on his chest with both hands whenever he needs something, and he cries when he does it. My son bites, punches, kicks, and has other aggressive behavior. What can I do? We oftentimes have patients come in who are aggressive and who are self-injurious. In addition to the first set of diagnostic things that we do, we, def we always want to look for pain um, because many times these kids can be in pain uh, and they're acting out because of the pain they're in. Common things we look for, we want to just make sure that their belly is clear, they're not constipated. Dental examinations. We've seen some pretty serious aggressive behaviors in kids who have like a, an abscessed tooth or a cavity that nobody's bothered to check. We do a really good, just kind of diffuse palpation exam. Make sure there's no, because sometimes it can be like a little broken bone, um, some area on their skin that's tender that nobody's noticed, skin breakdown in their diaper area. Check their scalp, make sure there's no lesions there. Check their nails, make sure there's no hangnails. And then in the tuber sclerosis specifically, folks can get those unwell fibromas, and they can get pretty large and bloody, and that can be painful as well. And then a urinalysis to make sure they're not having um, a UCI or a pyelonephritis that could be causing them to have some pretty extreme back <coughs> So what about some differential diagnoses? Uh, my son knows and understands everything but does not talk. Even if we make him repeat words, he forgets it soon. What can be done? My son is four years old. He gets agitated very often. He can't express himself. My son's understanding is very poor, hence he does not follow any instructions. My son has sensory issues. He flaps his hands, he needs pressure in his lower back and legs. So I'm so grateful that we have residents here today because I'm gonna pick on you guys. So if you hear these kinds of complaints, what sorts of diagnoses come to mind? The residents were like, I didn't know this was gonna be participatory. <laughs>
there just two right there? There's just the two of you? One. Who's hiding in the back? Okay. All right. One answer from each one of you. That'll, that'll make it fair. Everything that you're doing. 
Um, I know sometimes parents will come in and the kids may need a flu shot or they need something, and they'll say, Dr. Kipsey, you want to just, just grab them on three and, and try to give them a shot? It's like, mm -mm, mm -mm. no, I don't. I'll explain. We're going to give you a shot. It's going to hurt for a little while. I'm going to give you a hug. Mommy's going to be right here. Even if they don't have a single work, we don't know how much they might be. And think about how scary that would be for us if someone just grabbed us and tried to give us, you know, a shot and didn't explain it. Labeling. So I always encourage parents to, when their children aren't speaking as they expect, you know, so you know, label everything. Label if you have water bottles, label it as water. Label their cups. Label their favorite shirts. Label their toys. And when you give it to them, you say, hey, got some water and water. And you show them the word. And they're kind of getting this information over and over again. Using a visual picture schedule. So especially for routine. Um, rather than kind of like shouting out everything that needs to be done, having that picture there. Okay, first we get up, then we brush our teeth, then we go to the car, then we're going to school. So they kind of get the routine of it, and they can see it and do it and start learning those things. Making sure if they need it, having that communication device. And then using positive reinforcement. Um, this kid's oftentimes respond so well to praise and reward. Um, and even if they haven't accomplished whatever task we want them to accomplish to the fullest of 100%, if they get 25%, praise that 25%, because then we can push them to 50 and 75 and 100. So trying to use that positive reinforcement. Having patience. And then the importance of reassessment. Uh, because we can do all of our fancy, we can do our TAN checklists, our comprehensive evals, we can set up a beautiful treatment plan, and then if it's not going the way we expect, we could have been wrong about something. So just reassess and see how the child is doing. Symptomatic. Here, what I'm looking at are what are the targetable underlying medical diagnoses. So here we have some other questions. We have a child who's described as being stubborn, um, who's repetitively touching himself, um, needs somebody to sit with him. So there's a thing here, and the thing could be related to anxiety. Um, and so if we're thinking about anxiety, we might want to consider medication management. Um, SSRIs are an example. There are other ways to approach it. But then also considering the behavioral management too. But cognitive behavioral therapy targeted towards anxiety. Um, so not just kind of general, we're trying to target reducing anxiety. Okay. What about the child who's hyperactive? It could be that he has ADHD. Um, and if so, maybe we want to consider stimulants versus non-stimulants. And then also to behavioral management. Um, and the specific therapy I like to point out there is parent-child interaction therapy, which emphasizes forming a bond with a child before starting to give directives. And then organic. Intuber sclerosis, you know, it's not great to have any condition, but in tuber sclerosis, we have made advances such that there are medications that target the underlying cause and making sure we're aware of whether or not those are indicated. And I'll give you an example. So my son gets angry and then has convulsions. So two, two scenarios. One for his epilepsy. Um, these are three options that work on underlying cause of TSC. Have we considered them? Are they indicated for him? Another is maybe he has an astrocytoma and an N4 inhibitor. To so then here in lies another question. We know that we should be doing the same. Um, we know that it's recommended, but sometimes people might ask the question, well, how am I going to incorporate that into an already busy clinic? A um, couple of things. One is in our clinic, we will sometimes, we will, as a part of their new visit, we will mail the TAN checklist to them. It's freely available online, um, so that that way they can have some time to think about it and fill out the questions and bring it in with them. Um, I know in Dr. Kruger's clinic, they're piloting an iPad use, so they're able to do it, and then it goes into their medical record. Um, and then sometimes you can maybe collaborate with somebody on your team. I know in Dr. Gadgill's clinic, Ms. Desai, her psychologist, 
is doing the TAM checklist. So then that way they can, everybody can kind of work together. And just to emphasize, this is our team. You know, it takes a team approach to work on TAM. Um, and so making sure that, you know, you try to build a team around you. Um, you guys have residents, your students. Um, you know, you have parents who, who can probably help and volunteer. <laughs> Uh, but not feeling like you have to necessarily do it by yourself. So what are the last three takeaways? I'll just leave you with three things. One is screen early and often. Um, oftentimes, and here's, it's, this is one of the, um, I took this slide out for sake of time, but in TSC, sometimes people will come in and say, well, you know, I don't need that tan stuff, Dr. Gibson, because my child is a mild case. And, and I put it in quotes because there are folks who have less symptoms of TSC than others, and that's wonderful. But we still have to be aware of it, and we should still screen. Because it's much easier to screen early, and if nothing happens, then we have a pretty piece of paper, and it's all knows, and we're, we're all fine, and we're smooth. But if something does start to happen, we've thought about it, we know what our resources are, um, and we're ready to activate rather than waiting until behaviors escalate and then have to wait for the evaluation, then wait for the therapist, and then wait, try to get to school. Well, now it's summertime, we can't go to school. And, and it just kind of keeps cycling and getting, it's getting worse. Working with an interdisciplinary team um, is very important. And then reaching out. You know, reaching out to the TS Alliance, reaching out to your other colleagues. now. Now that we kind of all know each other and you know who's who's working on TAN and what they're doing, you're having trouble, just reach out, send an email, like, you know, make a phone call and see how this can be done. So future directions. This is an initiative. We're working on this project called the Tandem Project. And it's a very exciting initiative. It's, it's funded um, and it's bringing together people from all around the globe, um, including India. So Shoba uh, Shribasava, you guys, is representative um, for India. And what we're working on is trying to incorporate the TAN into a usable app. Um, and then also, as a consortium, putting together the best resources that we can about TAN so that you can have it in an easy-to-use format. So we're just at the beginning of this journey, and we're looking forward to next steps. Thank you, and happy to take any questions.